Welcome to Monitoring Strategy Considerations. I'm joined by David Orlandi, Senior Systems Consultant at Quest Software, who will discuss considerations as you develop monitoring and diagnostic strategy. My name is Lindsay Hooper, and I'm one of the Postgres conference organizers. I'll be your moderator for this webinar today. With that, I'm going to hand it off to David. Take it away. Thank you, Lindsay. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Lindsay mentioned, my name is David Orlandi. I'm with Quest, and I'm one of the database systems engineers here. More specifically, I'm part of the business unit with particular focus on database monitoring and diagnostics solutions. I've been with Quest for just over eight years now, and before Quest, I held a similar sales engineering role at Embarcadero Technologies. Some of you may be familiar with them. It's a database tools company based in the San Francisco Bay Area. All told, I've been a part of the database software industry for about 20 years now. So thank you for joining the session today. I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe out there. I hope you find this information I share useful to your day-to-day -day tasks and responsibilities. So let's uh, jump in and get started. The topic I'd like to share with you today is about the importance of monitoring and the many considerations as you develop a monitoring and diagnostics strategy. IT administrators need to keep an eye on availability, performance, and storage of mission critical environments. With this in mind, there are several things to consider and prioritize. In the session today, the areas I'll cover include all-in-one uh, versus specialized. Uh, in other words, uh, do you want a uh, monitoring solution that monitors lots of items, or do you want to have one that is laser focused on one or two items? Build versus buy. Do you want to uh, create and manage your own uh, scripts or your own homegrown solution, or uh, perhaps uh, invest in something off the shelf. Real-time diagnostics versus 24 by seven monitoring. We'll discuss advantages and disadvantages of both. Architecture, something uh, to really consider and is, is very important. What are the moving parts under the covers with the monitoring solution? Are there traditional agents? Uh, is there overhead associated with the monitoring and diagnostic solution? Does the architecture provide flexibility in uh, deployment? Configuration. Uh, are your databases on-prem, in the cloud, or do you have a hybrid uh, deployment? And the same would be asked uh, of your monitoring solution, whether you want it to be on-prem, in the cloud, or hybrid. We'll discuss alerting, notifications, and actions, uh, all of which are important uh, to stay ahead of potential issues and uh, be notified of potential problems. Understanding what is considered normal activity. Uh, so uh, in addition to uh, just seeing straight out metrics of things like memory pressure or latency or uh, query performance, uh, it's, it's important to know how your environment normally uh, runs and how it behaves and potentially be alerted if it's not acting normally. Advisories and troubleshooting suggestions. This is, uh, this is something most everyone uh, likes to have uh, to get advice or uh, some guidance on what to do next if uh, you do indeed uh, see performance issues and alerts uh, firing. Uh, documenting and uh, documenting the details of your uh, environment, uh, in other words, your monitoring uh, metrics, uh, and being able to communicate that out uh, to your stakeholders in your environment, uh, very important. And we'll round out the session today by reviewing some specific Postgres metrics and uh, discuss um, with uh, particular use cases. Okay. 
Now, as Lindsay mentioned, uh, I will uh, have a few questions for you, uh, the attendees. So um, the first one I have for you right now uh, is, uh, you know, I, I really, I just want to get a better understanding of uh, uh, the Postgres monitoring landscape uh, by polling you for, you know, just a sample size of data. Okay. So if you care to participate and share, it would be appreciated. Uh, the first one, uh, just use, again, the chat feature in Zoom to submit your an answers. And the first one is uh, uh, with an answer of one, two, three, or four, what are you mostly using uh, in your Postgres environment? Uh, is it uh, version nine, version 10, version 11, or version 12? Okay, all over the map, but I, I, I actually see um, what I expected so far, which is a lot of nine and a lot of 12. Uh, I'm personally seeing uh, less of uh, those in between, but it looks like we got, uh, mostly ones and fours with a few threes scattered in there. So nine, 11, and 12. Okay. Oh, and somebody squeezed in a version 10. Thank you for that. One more uh, I'll uh, cover here. Answer with one, two, or three. Uh, right now you're not really monitoring your Postgres environment or two, you're monitoring, but with your own queries or scripts or homegrown application. Or finally three, you indeed have invested and are using a third party solution. Okay, two, two and three, okay, great. Really appreciate the responses and the feedback. Okay, great, that's good information for me. So let's, uh, let's dive into the content of uh, today's topic and start out with all in one versus specialized. So perhaps we have some musicians in the audience, or uh, I'm guessing at least most of you like to listen to some kind of music. As a musician myself, I thought this analogy kind of hits the mark. When it comes to selecting a software solution, there's a tendency to lean towards an, a kind of a one-man band solution that empowers users to essentially do it all. Uh, though there are some efficiencies to gain this way, more often than not, each item addressed may suffer a bit. So this guitarist on the right is likely going to perform with more precision and accuracy than the one on the left, right? So too is, the often, is often the case with monitoring solutions. Uh, it's certainly possible for a monitoring solution to properly monitor several aspects of an environment, but there is a lot to consider. Your applications, the databases, the underlying hosts, virtual environments, middleware, storage arrays, and so on. But the more you include as a requirement for that one solution, it can create some friction and can often dilute areas of uh, concentration. In other words, it's important to identify your correct monitoring scope. Now, as you consider and add more requirements, you'll need to get buy-in from uh, other stakeholders in, in your uh, enterprise, right? And again, as you need uh, a solution to do more, details for particular areas of focus may indeed suffer. Now to take this analogy a bit further, the musician, the more uh, musicians and instruments you have, the more challenging it can be to be in concert, so to speak, right? So it helps to identify not only what needs to be monitoring, but also what items to be monitored are most closely related and with whom and or what other groups you will need to be and stay in concert with. A DBA likely needs detailed information about those databases, but also likely the underlying window and or Windows and or Linux host information. Uh, virtualization metrics may be important too. But for a DBA, how much uh, VM detail do you really need versus that of say a VMware administrator? Now, in my experience, application monitoring solutions often try to monitor everything, uh, but often fall short in particular areas. So again, find that correct scope for your monitoring solutions capabilities. 
build versus buy. I'll use another analogy and this time a house. Uh, there are lots of pluses and minuses to both build and buy and the things to consider are, uh, are similar. So uh, in that of build and buy versus, uh, for a monitoring solution. So with build, the big advantage is that you can customize uh, you know, the, you know, on the front end to your, to your heart's content. I want a roof with four gables. I want 18 windows. I want a basement. I want hardwood floors and so on. Now in doing, in doing so, what is it that you also have to weigh into that equation? The potential build downsides include time and cost. With a monitoring solution, build equals either homegrown scripts and or internally developed custom applications. Now moving away from that house analogy for a moment, uh, there are added considerations. Mindshare. What if the person or people who wrote and maintained the scripts and or custom applications leave? And what about all of the updates you may need uh, to do uh, if and as new versions of what you're monitoring are introduced? These new versions or additions may require rewrites to your scripts or internally developed applications. Now in the Postgres world, that may mean manually querying for those statistics, leveraging those uh, PG underscore stat tables and views. And here are some examples of that. Some of you who shared uh, that you're doing that today. Real-time diagnostics versus that of 24 by seven. Now, depending on your requirements for level of support, real-time diagnostics tools uh, can be all that certain environments need. You can run scripts and or open that client side utility to investigate what is going on right now. And that could be effective and sometimes enough. Now that said, uh, to know that there is an issue going on, unless you have just run those diagnostics, uh, this method often relies on getting feedback from the end users, internal or external, and them sharing things like, I, I can't connect or, or things are slow. So with 24 by seven monitoring solutions, uh, though there will be a bit more to the architecture and, and likely higher cost, you won't miss anything uh, because those 24 by seven solutions will typically offer things like uh, alerts, uh, but also notifications. You can get an email if a problem arises, things like that, but also a repository to hold historical data often with the ability to use the user interface to pull data from a historical window of time to understand what happened in the past. And sometimes those solutions offer a means to query that repository directly. Now here's an example of an architecture slide. I removed the naming convention uh, to protect the innocent. Uh, there are a number of items to consider uh, specific to a software solutions architecture. Does it cost money per component? And based on what your needs or requirements are, might you need to add components? Is that architecture flexible? For example, how does it work with uh, the DM a DMZ? Or what if there are multiple domains? Uh, another thing to consider, are there upper limits to what be can be monitored? What is its resource consumption or overhead? Uh, you often hear that in X percentage, 2%, 3% or more. How about agents, traditional agents? And what I mean by that is, uh, does the solution require that you install software or services or binaries on uh, what you wanna monitor, on that monitored host? If so, that invasiveness can have implications. There might be additional overhead. You might need to now engage additional business stakeholders, uh, things like getting approval and access to install those agents. And these agents may need updating over time. So in general, I found that uh, though there are some advantages for detailed metrics, uh, most folks prefer to avoid uh, solutions or architectures uh, that leverage traditional agents. What about the monitoring solutions graphic user interface? Is it a thick client? Now, if it 
if that's the case, it means you'll need to install a client side software wherever you want to view your monitoring metrics, as opposed to say a web-based client. Now the look and feel between a thick client or a web-based client uh, is, is obviously personal preference, but at least with a web-based GUI, all you need is access to a web browser. So those are more things to consider. Your configuration or your deployment. Now, what I'm about to cover, these questions will pertain both to the deployment of the monitoring software itself and what you need or want to monitor. So is what you want monitored on-prem? And can the monitoring solution be installed on-prem? Is what you want monitored in the cloud? Is it uh, infrastructure as a service? Might it be a uh, platform or database as a service? Is the monitoring solution able to be deployed to the cloud in that case? Uh, some, some folks need or want a SaaS model for your monitoring solution, software as a service. Is that de deployment option available for the monitoring solutions you're considering? And then, uh, of course, the same questions apply uh, for a hy hybrid approach. So this is the last of uh, a few um, polling questions I have. Uh, again, please use the chat feature in Zoom and answer with one, two, or three to best describe your Postgres deployment. One, everything is on-prem. Two, everything is in the cloud. And that could take the form of maybe it's uh, Azure. Uh, maybe it's uh, AWS RDS, uh, maybe it's uh, Aurora. Or three, you have a hybrid deployment and a little bit of both. And that's a really good mix. Uh, I'm seeing almost an even split between one, two, and three. Great, okay. In my personal experience, I'm seeing more and more folks uh, moving to the cloud um, and that that transition has really happened probably in the past, only the past 18 months or so. Before that, uh, I was seeing, um, by and large, mostly on-prem deployments. Um, and when it started going to the cloud, I saw quite a bit of RDS, uh, quite a bit of uh, Aurora. And then very recently, I'm seeing more and more uh, Azure deployments. Now let's move on to discussing alerts as it relates to a monitoring and diagnostic solution. Now most monitoring solutions offer alerting capabilities. Um, thresholds can be defined, and if the, that threshold is crossed, the alarm fires. Now what's important to realize though is that some sol solutions don't offer this capability out of the box. In other words, it requires a lot of front-end setup work to get a usable monitoring solution. And uh, I would think that in the time that it takes to set it up, you might be missing some important activity, activity that's causing issues in your environment. Now these alerts will typically be visual alerts, various colors, yellow, orange, or red, uh, signaling the uh, severity of that threshold crossing. And you know that's obviously a, a very important to stay abreast of potential availability and performance problems. But uh, now what if you don't have the solutions uh, user interface open and actively looking at it? And what will you do about these issues? And you know, that's quite, on, quite honestly often the case, right? It's, it's not uh, going to be all the time that you are able to have uh, a monitoring solutions uh, interface open and engaging with it. Uh, most everyone on the line, I have no doubt, is wearing many hats and uh, uh, juggling uh, lots of various projects and tasks. That's where notifications and actions are critically important to a monitoring and diagnostic solution. For example, a threshold is crossed, an alarm fires, you can get say an email or a text message to be made aware of the issue. Um, again, when you're not actively looking at that graphic user interface, which is probably more likely than not. Uh, actions can be equally useful. Uh, some monitoring solutions allow for an action to be initiated 
based on that threshold crossing. So for example, a threshold is crossed, an alarm fires, and you can have it configured to run a corrective script or maybe kick off an SNMP trap to work with maybe your ticketing, ticketing system like Remedy or ServiceNow and have that alarm initiate a ticket. Again, these are great ways uh, to be more proactive and stay ahead of issues and be more productive in the process in more of an automated fashion. Baselines. Now, conceptually, we're all probably pretty familiar with the idea of baselines. It's a minimum or starting point used for comparisons or a fixed reference point. And uh, I would say you'd want to consider a monitoring solution that generates and maintains baselines. Now, why are baselines important? Well, it establishes what is considered normal activity for that time period. That way, it's easier to identify what is abnormal activity, and therefore potential issues can be more efficiently identified. So you may find that sometimes the term baseline is, is used loosely and is really a comparison of an earlier window of time. Uh, but that's really trending versus baselining. Baselines can be generated or learned a number of different ways. Uh, it, there can be algorithms run underneath the covers uh, periodically. Uh, it may be machine learning, uh, or uh, I've, I've even uh, seen AI being utilized. Now, an added beneficial capability is for the monitoring solution to be able to alert you if activity starts to behave abnormally. So for example, it's useful uh, to be alerted of say CPU spikes to 90%. However, it has more context and is more actionable if you also have the information that for that particular time period, CPU is normally 50%. Or conversely, CPU is normally 90% for that time period. So that latter example is probably less pressing, right? It may not even be a problem. Rather, it's an expected workload for that time. So again, uh, a baseline can provide more context in the metrics and values that you're seeing. Advisories, suggestions to fix, guidance, all those kinds of things. Now, whether you're new to the field or a seasoned IT professional, most everyone welcomes troubleshooting suggestions. Look for a monitoring solution that offers this, as not all of them do. It's best if the suggestions are specific, specific to flagged activity. Um, they're sometimes referred to as advisories or, or a similar name. Uh, and what they'll do is describe that flagged activity provide some context around the potential issue and offer suggestions as to how to administer and fix the problem. And oftentimes, as uh, you all probably already know, there's more than one potential cause and therefore more than one suggested remedy. Now, this is again, another example of how your monitoring solution can provide efficiency gains. And uh, this particular uh, screenshot so shows uh, some examples of advisories. Let's talk about reports. It's important to consider if you need the ability to both document performance metrics and or share that data with other stakeholders at your company. You'll definitely want to consider a solution that offers these capabilities. But there's more to this concept. You wanna dig in further and find out if the solution First of all, offers out-of-the-box reports. These are handy to save time. Creating your own reports can be time-consuming, but ideally you'd want both, right? Out-of-the-box reports for well-formatted reports to generate quickly, but also the flexibility to create custom reports to address documentation or communication requirements with specific content. You also want to find out if these reports can be scheduled and or emailed. That makes things easier and more automated as well. Dashboards, and what I mean by dashboards, uh, essentially uh, categorized pages of metrics. Uh, so for example, a memory dashboard with 
memory specific metrics. Now, some solutions claim to support and monitor virtually any source. But here's the catch. Many of these solutions require that you build out dashboards yourself. No out of the box dashboards available whatsoever. Uh, that actually caught me by surprise because the next question that comes to mind for me is that, you know, what are, what are you paying for? Uh, from both a value and efficiency standpoint, out of the box dashboards are something that you should demand. Otherwise, you're, you're not all that far from the build option that we discussed earlier, like scripts and so on. So out of the box dashboards uh, are something uh, you should definitely require uh, when looking for a monitoring solution. Uh, but having said that, it's even better if the monitoring solution provides a means to create your own custom dashboards. Not unlike custom reports, custom dashboards provide the power and flexibility to build them out with your own customized content, but also customized display of those metrics. So uh, having the ability, for example, to choose from a table versus a graph or a chart or a real-time uh, spinner or a volume cylinder or, and so on. Either way, out of the box or custom, these dashboards should be considered a step better than reports when it comes to monitoring data. Now, why is that? Uh, most of us are, are kind of programmed to be able to want and need to uh, share reports. But in the case of monitoring, uh, monitor data is, is always changing, right? The data may be hours or minutes or even seconds from having new values. Reports are static, which means the report content is going to become stale and often fairly quickly. So with dashboards, the data is being refreshed in that repetitive fashion. So the data is more meaningful and up to date. It's as real time as the last time the data was retrieved. So we all know that important decisions are best made when the data is current and therefore relevant. And finally, the ease with which these custom dashboards can be shared is pretty critical. The creation of custom dashboards is ideal for providing subsets of data to different groups in the enterprise. So maybe the storage admins simply need those six critical storage metrics. Maybe management only wants summarize trended data and so on. Now that can create communication synergy between those groups. So it must be easy to share those dashboards. So how about simply sharing a link to that web-based dashboard? It really can't get easier than that. And that's possible and available with the best monitoring and diagnostics solutions. To round out the session, I thought I would, it would be useful to discuss some common performance problems with Postgres so that you can decide with what and how you'll monitor your Postgres instances. And you can be sure the solution of choice includes the means by which to address them. Now, obviously this is a subset of common performance issues, uh, but I've included locks, query performance, disk space usage, uh, the concept of bloat, and finally, um, considering administration capabilities. First, we'll take a look at locks. Now, uh, as many of you are probably already aware, one of the most valuable capabilities of Postgres is its support for concurrent ACID transactions. ACID being that acronym for atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. These database transaction properties help verify data validity. It's important to understand that locking can be a common occurrence in active Postgres databases. This is because Postgres uses these levels of locking as one of the ways to safely implement these concurrent ACID transactions. Now that said, managing peak performance includes being aware of queries that might be taking too long to run. In some cases, these commands might be waiting for a lock. Helpful information uh, includes things like the process ID, the user, 
the query that performed it, the query start time, and in the case of Postgres, again, if that lock has been granted or not, true or false. If it is deadlocked, one or more may not have been granted. So you'll want to consider a monitoring solution that can both identify and alert you upon potential deadlock transactions. Query performance. I think it's safe to say that we probably spend an inordinate amount of time in this area uh, because sometimes it comes to, just comes down to uh, those queries and uh, who's running them and uh, where are those bottlenecks. So uh, one of the primary tasks of any DBA is to find and optimize poorly performing queries. It's not a trivial job. It's as oftentimes there's too much data to sort through and pinpoint problems. One angle to take is to find queries taking a longer amount of time to run and or find those statements with low hit percentages. This can be a, a, actually a result of long running statements. Now Postgres tracks patterns of data access and keeps frequently accessed data in cache. It's best to keep a cache hit rate of about 99%. And you might wanna consider increasing the cache available with a ratio significantly lower. So find a monitoring solution that can both identify and alert you about these types of queries. Disk space usage. Now many things can happen if the database runs out of disk space and really none of them are good. DBAs understand that it's essential to monitor database disk space so that critical business processes are uninterrupted. An appropriate means for monitoring this may be to alert if, say, the average calculated table space growth for Postgres, that rate uh, is going to use uh, up the existing space on the hard drive and say within X number of days. Um, I've included an example, um, or, or this, this here really uh, is an example of why it's important to consider monitoring not only the database, but that underlying host as well. Um, this is an example of you know, correlating that information. Now, as a side note, it's generally not able to be accomplished when monitoring a DBAS environment, a database as a service. Uh, but really, the disk space would be managed by the service anyway. To further diagnose space issues, first determine the databases and tables using those table spaces. Make note of those databases and tables growth rate over time to help narrow down and determine which may be responsible for that increased table space growth. Now, keeping in mind, of course, that table spaces can often host multiple databases and tables. Now, another possibility for unexpected growth is that the system has not been vacuumed in some time. And this concept leads me to my final two areas to factor in. Bloat. So you'll wanna look for large tables and then see if there's a high number of what are called dead tuples. So um, again, as many of you are probably already familiar, Postgres, uh, in Postgres, the, the tuples are essentially uh, logical representations of rows. Uh, tuples are not actually removed when they are uh, marked uh, when they're deleted. Rather, rather they're marked for deletion, and those are considered dead tuples. Now, a vacuum is just that administrative process by which these dead tuples are cleared out to remove that dead space from the file. So, once again, having uh, the ability to get alerts on uh, um, your uh, number of dead tuples versus live tuples or uh, index bloat is a, is a common issue uh, in Postgres. The ability to be alerted on those kinds of things uh, can be very, very useful. And lastly, administration. To allow for a more seamless workflow, it's ideal to be able to take action or administer items you have identified with your monitoring and diagnostic solution. So some examples I've included here are, are some of the next steps involved with the use cases we just reviewed. 
So for example, uh, you have excessive locks waiting. It, it would be nice to have a solution that allows you to cancel that query or terminate the connection. Experiencing database table or index bloat have the ability to vacuum those dead tuples. Other administration examples include um, maybe needing to better understand the query steps and how long each step is taking for tuning purposes. If you have that need, generate an explain plan. Now, if you've made changes to the table structure or query and you're ready to test per performance, another administrative uh, capability that's nice to have is to reset tracking statistics to display that new performance data. Now we covered quite a bit in this session. Uh, I hope it proved helpful and perhaps provides you a checklist of sorts of the important items to consider as you plan your environment's Postgres monitoring strategy. So I appreciate everybody's time and attention today. And we certainly have uh, time for questions. So uh, one of the questions asked was, uh, is there a, a product available from Quest? And, and there is, and that's something I can uh, speak offline with you about. Uh, I know that Postgres would like to keep these uh, outside of the scope of uh, uh, particular products by uh, one of the vendors. But yes, as I, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, my primary job is to uh, support Quest uh, monitoring and diagnostics solutions. Uh, a couple of solutions called fog light and spotlight. Uh, so along the uh, same lines, uh, is there an all-in-one tool for this? And uh, I guess I wasn't uh, pulling the wool over anyone's eyes with uh, my screenshots. Uh, they are indeed from uh, Quest's fog light solution that has all of these capabilities, yes. Just one added note there. Uh, uh, the Quest Foglight solution uh, is a cross DBMS platform solution. So not only will it allow you to monitor Postgres, but other DBMSs as well. As we found, most all environments now uh, have multiple platforms. So maybe Postgres, but also maybe Oracle or DB2 or Microsoft SQL Server or MySQL or MongoDB, uh, Cassandra, and so on. Okay, well, again, before you jump off, I wanted to thank you again very much for your time and attention today. And uh, again, I hope uh, the content proved helpful. And thank you, David. Um, this was fantastic, um, really wonderful presentation. Um, I wanna thank all of our attendees as well. So regardless of where you are, I hope you have a good morning, a good afternoon, or a great evening. And um, I hope to see you on the next one. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.